Welcome, I'm Nick Zeppos, the Chancellor at Vanderbilt University, and this is the Zeppos Report, a podcast where I have a chance to talk with the people shaping and helping us understand our world. Uh, I am very proud today to uh, let you know that my guest is Jerry Wilmink, and uh, Jerry earned his biomedical engineering degree at Vanderbilt, then he went on and got a master's degree in engineering, a PhD, all from Vanderbilt. Then Jerry went on to found the first terahertz biosensing laboratory, and Jerry's going to explain what all that is, at the Air Force Research Laboratory before launching Wiseware Corporation. Mm -hmm. And I've got a brochure right here. I wish we are on TV here, <laughs> Jerry. I'm, I'd put it up and uh, show people what amazing things you're doing. Um, your latest product has been described as a fitness monitoring, security alert, business management system encased in a stylish, beautiful bracelet. Jerry, mm -hmm. it's so great to have you here today. Thank I'm you. so proud. Thank you so much, Chancellor. This is, it's a, I'm humbled and honored to be here and to be able to speak with you and tell you the story on Wiseware. Well, you know, I look at your pedigree, and you got mm -hmm. the engineering BA, you got the master's, you got the PhD, you're at the National Academy of Sciences, you're setting up this uh, terahertz biosensing lab. It sounds all really high-powered academic scientists, yeah. but yet you're also a CEO of a company. Yeah. So you're kind of this brilliant entrepreneur, mad scientist. <laughs> Where does the mad scientist fit in? And I guess you've referred to yourself as a mad scientist. Yeah. Where does that fit in with really scaling, starting and scaling up a business. Yeah, I, I think the, the mad scientist that's obsessed with solving a problem. You know, when my grandfather passed uh, the day after Christmas in 2011, it was a problem that when I started to explore it, it was a big problem. It was much bigger than I had initially thought. You know, many seniors were falling, many seniors were passing away. And the problem I got obsessed with and creating solutions to prevent seniors from falling. And that's really what drove me as I converted from a mad scientist to a, you know, an entrepreneur on a vision um, and to solve that problem. But there's this incredible human dimension you were telling me before our show started here, Jerry, about your grandfather coming to commencement and yeah. you could see him walk. He came for all the degrees. Yes. Uh, every before. graduation. Yeah. We, we would joke around actually. I was like, Grandpa, you know you don't have to come to every one of these. You know, and he said, you know, I look forward to coming beforehand and then I enjoy thinking about it afterward. It is hard on my body during. <laughs> but you, you talked about well, you could see him limping a little bit and yeah. in it, retrospect then you you lost him, this person really who raised you, Grandpa Dominic. Yep. And that story really motivated you to deploy your scientific and human dimensions. Exactly. You know, actually, when I was 12, my, my parents got divorced. and I was an only child. And my mother and I moved in with my grandparents. And my mother was the first to go to college and in our entire family wow. at age 33. And then she went to law school. And at then she, age 33. Age 33. And then she started her own law firm to help other um, other women that were struggling with divorce and seeing her as a kid studying for the, you know, for the bar exam and having friends over in later in life, I think through osmosis too, it showed me the value of education. And it also showed me an entrepreneurial side of, you know, starting her own practice to help others. And that, that kind of laid down, you know, the foundation. And then when my grandfather passed from after he fell in October, 2011, that was the, the catalyst that we could create products that could prevent seniors from falling. And that was the, the beginning and the core of Wiseware, which we developed a, a biosensing hearing aid that can pick up when a senior's dehydrated, when they're at risk for falling, and then potentially even prevent them from falling. Yeah, tell me the, I, I'm I, just for your, uh, 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 our great listeners out there, I'm looking at uh, a brochure here that has some of the most beautiful jewelry. I've seen, and then I've got these beautiful pieces of jewelry here, and then I open them up, and it looks like the inside of my iPhone or <laughs> uh, the inside of my laptop. Um, what was the marriage of aesthetic and technology, and how did you bring those together? Because 
I think entrepreneurs are artists. Mm -hmm. They're imagining something in their head. They're imagining your grandfather falling and what would have saved him and who would want to wear it and exactly. is it ugly? Is it clumsy? Yeah, uh, it's an excellent question. And it's, we call ourselves fusionists as we're fusing fashion with threads of technology, life-saving technology. And it's really the, the convergence of two worlds, the artist, the designer, and the technologist, the engineer. And when we launched with Iris Apfel, the interior designer for the White House, that was kind of how we launched it, is I'm the young, crazy scientist engineer, and she's the more seasoned uh, <laughs> interior designer at age 96. And it was this fusion of two worlds um, with the goal of making things aesthetically appealing so the technology would disappear and the result is they would actually wear the product. And so now we'd have the data and we'd be able to pro you know, help them and keep them safe and secure. Um, some of the biggest problems we see with conventional technologies, either a push button kind of device or any kind of other safety button is they're not aesthetically appealing and they, they carry a tremendous amount of stigma uh, where seniors are not really happy to wear that device in public. And so this is something that, in a discreet way, provides that safety function, and they can be proud to wear it and age in place. Well, you've talked about Iris Apfo and this remar <laughs> remarkable partnership yeah. of the mad scientist <laughs> and the fashion icon. Um, talk a little bit about the 2016 Consumer Electric Show. Oh, yeah. Talk to me a little bit about how you made the transition from technology to product to the meeting with Iris. Yeah. And tell us that story. Oh, yeah, you bet. So um, the, the back story on this is we launched a physical fitness product uh, that was actually a really advanced physical fitness product, and it was an utter failure. And we launched that Indiegogo. It was embarrassing. And I ended up going to the Consumer Electronics Show that year, met a gentleman from Intel, and he said, you know, you have this antenna system. You can transmit any radio frequency wave through metal materials. So you can make any metal device smart. Why don't you consider making metal devices for the military that are connected or even jewelry? Uh, and so this was, this was pretty funny because we're really hardcore electrical engineers and nerds. Yeah, and the Air Force thing makes sense, Joe. I get it, the military, but jewelry. Jewelry. Right? So he uh, ends up introducing us to the co-founder of Hippolyta, uh, some of the designers from Alexis Batar, all in New York, and they fly down. It was like the Devil Wears Prada visits the nerds down in San Antonio. <laughs> <laughs> and we, <laughs> we sat the at the table and made the first, the first product, you know, and, and ended up launching that the next year at the show. And we were the third most viewed company uh, at the entire Consumer Electronics Show, which there's 4,600 companies there. Uh, which is in incredible, and then it was featured on the Today Show for Top Tech of the Year and Fast Company, and and then it helped us kind of elevate our you know garage company into a real a real company. Yeah, I mean, uh, Jerry did start out in a garage. There's <laughs> there's no, it's not made up. It's a yeah. garage startup company. Jerry, talk about um, the technology mm -hmm. and how this Wisewear bracelet mm -hmm. allows you to encase it in metal and what it really does because you were yeah. telling me all the things that yeah. it does yeah. so talk about the encasing in the metal and what you're able to do for thousands and potentially millions of people yeah. and their families yeah. with this technology yeah you got it so i mean we build a whole family of products connected products for the family to keep you safe and secure and so this first version is specifically for women, and it allows them to call help, essentially a panic button, built, fused inside of a beautiful piece of jewelry. So they can wear it. If they ever need help, they just flip their wrist, tap the bracelet, makes a phone call, and sends out their GPS coordinates. Um, it also functions as a conventional fitness tracker. Uh, so counting your steps and calories burned, and then also has notifications built into it. So you need to get a specific email or a text. It will vibrate once or twice, or you know you're running mm -hmm. over on a podcast. You know, yeah. it vibrate three times. You know, so. yeah, I hate that <laughs> yeah. One. yeah. A little turning up the shock. <laughs> exactly. So that was the you know the first product that we launched. It's now at Nordstrom's and Saks. Um, but we're working on next generation versions for children. Uh, that actually work with off, um, it's a cellular independent network. 
And so that next family of products will be independent from the cellular infrastructure. And so always connected, and it also is a globally connected product. So wherever you go across the globe, you don't need your smartphone. It will always be connected and provide safety. Um, so that's really the kind of basic function is safety and security. And our premium package, which comes out this year, allows um, our private security firms that we work with to provide, it's like Uber with guns, basically, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. to provide your help on command. Yeah. Yeah. And you talked about this could be something for, you know, obviously uh, people out in the community, uh, uh, women uh, uh, walking home correct, uh, uh, on a college campus or in a community um, or driving a car. Also, you talked about global travel, business people, correct, and how this could be something that would be very, very attractive there. Um, just so many different applications. Um, let me let me kind of, uh, where is tech? I mean, I kind of think of when I first started buying laptops or mm -hmm. cell phones and, and um, you know, and, the, and this kind of like IBM computers had to be that ugly off-white and that was their brand. Yeah. And then I remember buying an a iMac that looked like a, a, the color of an old Ford Edsel. And <laughs> Steve Jobs really morphed design and technology. Yeah. And... Where are, I mean, clearly that's what you're able to do. You've made these discoveries and then you can make it an attractive device that Correct. someone will wear that removes the hurdle Correct. to wearing something. Exactly so right. where are we on the blending of design and technology? Uh, that's and, a great question. And as an entrepreneur who's working with Iris and all of these mm -hmm. designers, where do you think technology really is in that design marriage to partnership? Excellent, excellent question. And that fusion of those two worlds, what we're going to see, I think, in the next you know couple of years here is you've seen it already. So the the desktop computer and the laptop to the wearable to the smart garments to the implantable technology is getting closer to the body. So as technology gets closer to the body and is more intimately engaged with the human body, it needs to be designed as such, you know, because now it's really got a connection. You know, we almost have an affinity for our technologies now. So they need to be designed in such a way. Um, what we're seeing uh, is that in addition to that going on where the technology is coming closer to the body, we want the technology to empower people, but we don't want to showcase the technology. We want it to become invisible. And so I, I call it like the thermodynamics of technology, where we're going from a, a block to a liquid to a gas. And once it's a gas, it's ubiquitous, mm -hmm. right? And so that's kind of the, the phase we're going through in this fourth industrial revolution is everything's getting connected. Sensors, technology, and now we can automate and make life that much better, whether it's in healthcare, uh, which Vanderbilt's doing a fantastic job here in kind of leading the, you know, leading the edge in terms of what's possible and taking that data and, you know, providing those predictive analytics. Uh, so in that, that's that we're going to see that in the next few years in healthcare is devices will be designed with the human in mind and human centered. You know, and that's that's kind of what we're doing with our products is trying to make it a more seamless interface. Yeah, we, we've started this whole uh, part of our curriculum we call human centered design. Mm -hmm. And I think what you're pointing out is the technology is really allowing us to move that to really the human body and it's touchable and proximate and it's attractive mm -hmm. and um, it therefore can do more exactly. for people. Mm -hmm. um, I think of the work, uh, I happened to read an essay the other day on um, hearing aids yeah. and just the efficacy, but also the stigma yeah. associated with, oh, the person has a large hearing aid. So what you're talking about is really, well, how do we make the technology so that it's just it's part of you yeah. and it's not making you stand out in a way that may lead to stigma mm -hmm. or discrimination mm -hmm. and it makes you feel good as a person for what you're wearing and what you're 
doing. Exactly. Um, talk to me a little bit about um, machine learning. Mm -hmm. And we hear a lot about machine learning. Yeah. And um, I just was looking at something on machine learning and radiology yeah. and reading x-rays. Um, your initial device... Mm -hmm and other devices use machine learning. How do you think we should understand that as humans yeah. who learn? Yeah. Talk yeah. to us about what it is and why we should embrace it in what we're doing in our lives. Yeah, I, I think it, in particular machine learning, it's gonna revolutionize healthcare in the connected digital health sphere. And what we're seeing is by taking, you know, these are all the pipes for the data, which is the oil, right? It's the new oil. So all these different types of pipe, whether it's the belt buckle, the hearing aid, this allows us to get to the data. Because if they're not beautifully designed and they're not being worn, we can't get the data. And so when the data comes in, now we're starting to do some really advanced, I just brought out a PhD in machine learning actually. Really? Yes, and he's been doing, his name's Yafit, he is brilliant. And what him and Dave Elam, uh, my other partner, have been looking at is just, just looking at six axes of motion, X, Y, Z, alpha, beta, gamma. And as a senior's changing gait and balance, they've got you know, stockpiles of data. And they're going through this and training individuals and then looking at, okay, what are the changes in real time? And is there, you know, what are those changes something we need to act on or, you know, to basically get some type of treatment there? Um, honestly, it's becoming an, it's probably the most important area going forward is how to take that data and make it very useful and pull the signals out of that noise and then, you know, have a system that can automatically tell you kind of what's wrong. But we're just kind of at the beginning, and it's really kind of a buzzword right now, AI and you know, artificial intelligence. And it's becoming more real, though. Yeah. Um, and we're just starting to tap into some of the data sets now. I think what's amazing about your career is you know, how fashion, applied, basic, entrepreneur, you're covering the whole waterfront. And you are really in a position where you go back to the story about your grandfather, you watched him. Yep. But yep. now you're going to have machine learning yep. that actually tries to make sure that in advance of a fall, we know those things. You got it. But you still are so human-centered that you're always going to be watching people. Yeah. And how can I help them? And so it can be a virtuous circle mm -hmm. of hypothesis, machine learning, observation, hypothesis, exactly. machine learning, which obviously you bring to all your work. Um, you talked to me about a failure that you had. Yeah. And um, what are the lessons you can give these young kids? You're on the campus. You're going to give a, uh, yeah. the Chambers lecture today. Yeah. We're so proud of you. What are the things you did, the best thing you did, and what's the thing that you'd say, that was not a smart thing yeah. as I was launching this new product? <laughs> and, you know, I tell people all the time, they say, well, you know, what's your job like? I said, well, you know, I just try to do the best I can. I make mistakes, and yeah. you try to have an on-ramp and an off-ramp, yeah. so it's not existential. What are your learning on mistakes, and then... What is your, like, here's a really good thing I did? Yeah. Yeah. So what I've really tried to focus on in, as the CEO of Wiseware, is I bring on really talented people on the team that, you know, are skilled in areas to support me, you know, in the areas that I'm weak. For instance, I, even on operations side, that's not my forte. You know, I'm, I'm much better at, you know, recruiting getting people to drink the Kool-Aid before there's any Kool-Aid. Um, yeah. The big idea and then getting the right people in place to execute on the big idea. So I think that at Vanderbilt, the things that I really learned and was probably most important is basically the friends and the people in the network you know, that come out of Vanderbilt. I still go to all the Vanderbilt alumni functions in great. San Antonio. We have a huge group yeah, down yeah, there. Yeah, great. And it's just a big family. And 
seeing Vanderbilt grow over the years has been incredible. And actually, our, our patent attorney, and his name is Barrett Spragans, also my best friend from Vanderbilt, <laughs> electrical engineer, does yeah. all our patents. Wow. But it's those relationships that are really, really important. I mean, the learning is critical, but the relationships going forward is what you can draw from and really kind of leverage uh, your career. You know, so I think that looking back, I would even spend more time even in, you know, different activities, uh, making sure that those relationships were built. Yeah, I, I uh, tell people all the time, I'm just, you know, they say, what's your job? I said, I'm just HR. I just find all my weaknesses. I find what are the needs of the university. And then I go recruit, recruit people better than I am. And I think that's a valuable lesson yeah. to people, particularly as someone as gifted as you with all these degrees, a lot of people will say, well, he knows everything. Yeah, and that's... he's the founder. It's like, <laughs> no, I heard so-and-so. And so I think that's a very, very, very important lesson. Um, any things you just did that you just would say, God, that was not the thing to do at the time. Yeah. And it's... um. That's a good question. Um, I'd see some of my biggest mistakes. I was probably, uh, I had a lot of fun here in undergrad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so that was a lot of fun. But um, biggest mistakes, I'd say maybe not taking enough risk, you know, and actually in, from a startup standpoint, I think at a younger age. Yeah. You know, I have a wife and three beautiful children now, yeah. and the risk is a little higher now. Yeah. And if you're, in college and you just graduate or even still in college, trying your hand at innovation, starting a new business because you really, you don't have the, the, the risk is minimal compared to what it is later. Um, and I think that, that that'd be something from an entrepreneurial entrepreneurial standpoint of kind of going for it and have the courage to go do it. Okay. Yeah. I use a lot of wisdom to that. I, I know as sometimes as a professor, the students will come to me and say, well, I'm worried about this. And, you know, or maybe I could do this. I'm like, whatever you do, it's just you. I don't think you have a family or a mortgage. Yep. Take a little risk up front. Yeah. You know, take a job that's maybe a little different. Go live somewhere else that is different. Mm -hmm. And it's not as if you're going to be able to do that in 15 years when you have three children and it's yeah. like, hey, we're going to move to... <laughs> Germany to yeah. live. It's like, what? And so I, I think that's some, some really, really good advice. Um, tell me, what are your days like? Mm -hmm. You know, if I said you're spending the day 30% on selling, 30% managing, 30% meeting with my investor, what's your, what's a a normal day. Yeah. <laughs> or, yeah. Or, 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 <laughs> that's, Jerry. that's a good there question. There is no normal day, I know. Yeah, yeah it's what definitely. What is a normal day for you, Jerry? Yeah, it, de it depends. I think, you know, a, a big chunk is fundraising. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, you know, cash is, is the gas, yeah. you know, and so that, that's required. So a big chunk of that is fundraising, uh, meeting with partners for licensing deals, um, larger companies, smaller companies, um, meeting with, you know, other innovators where we can work with them. Maybe I, I'm, you know, I'm really addicted to bringing ideas to life. Yeah. So to see, you know, I work uh, as a mentor with tech stars and it's one of the, you know, kind of startup accelerators, top startup accelerators. And I work with those guys. we actually incubate another company at Wiseware too. Wow. Um, I just knew how hard it was getting started. So we brought in a company called Reckon Point. Um, so a big chunk of my time is uh, fundraising, recruiting, uh, setting the kind of corporate strategy, the vision, um, trying to cut out things that we can't do just yet. Um, and that's hard for me because yeah. I want to do it all, you yeah. know, and, um, and then a big chunk is I, I'm actually on the road a lot um, and media, TV um, for marketing. And so it's been interesting meeting with buyers you know, yeah. so as an engineer meeting with like yeah. the buyer from Bloomingdale's, yeah. it was yeah. like, this is interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so it's, uh, it's, and then I spend some time when I'm allowed to hang out with our technologist yeah. and <laughs> writing grants and doing cool tech stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. That, it's always a like treat. Getting back to the roots. You yeah. know, it's kind of like, <laughs> I'm kind of like them. It's yeah. like, you know, that's where I started. Those are my roots. Yeah. And, uh, well, um, 
it's been really, really great to be here today with you, Jerry. Um, you can download this and other episodes of the Zeppos Report at vu.edu, zeppos-report. Chancellor Hurd once said, uh, you know, the students, we every year at Vanderbilt now, we say these are the best students ever. The real test, as Chancellor Hurd said, is not who comes in. It's what the alumni do. And that's the real measure of a great university. And I'm here saying I'm sitting with one of our really distinguished, very, very energetic entrepreneurial alums. And I'm very proud to call you a triple door, Jerry. <laughs> so thanks so much for coming on the Zeppos Report. Thank you so much. Too kind. Thank you. Thank you.